Hi, I hope you enjoyed a beautiful Shabbos. Good Vach Shavuot Tov. We're continuing our series on transforming relationships. A big shout out and thank you to Chazach, to Tarni Time, Chickens for Shabbos, and to my uh, co host here, uh, the uh, amazing, incomparable Rabbi David Golwasser. So, Last we left off was speaking about something called the reticular activating system. The reticular activating system, RAS for short, is responsible for honing in on what's important and uh, dismissing what's not. And we spoke about its importance in terms of our relationships and looking for the good and finding the good. Because here's the thing, more important than what you say to somebody is what you think of somebody and they know what you're thinking. You don't, you know, you ever see somebody and it's just like, you know, you can almost tell that they either like you or don't like you, and, and no matter how hard they try to disguise it, it just sort of comes across. Which is why, by focusing on the positive, it's not just about a nice idea. It literally transforms the entire of the interaction, the entire of the conversation, the rhythm, the cadence, everything that flows from that is entirely different, different because you're looking for the positive. So, the reticular activating system is located here, interestingly enough, in the region of the Luz bone. And its job, again, acts as a filtering mechanism. We would be overwhelmed by so much stimuli that came in on a daily basis. So what it does is, it says, if this is important, this is what you focus on. If this is not, then not. So for example, if you are thinking of getting a, a new minivan or a new pair of glasses or a new hat or a new shade tool or a new tie, whatever it is, is on your mind, you'll begin to see that out in the world. It's not, of course, that Hashem created more of these products to come into your space, but rather what is in your purview, in your Dalit Amis, you're now paying attention to that you previously dismissed. Now, it works the same way with our relationships. If you're looking for the good, right, you're going to see something that you might have missed easily if you were looking for the negative. And obviously it works in the converse. If you're looking for the worst, if you're thinking the worst, expecting the worst, then certainly you're going to find that. But here's what's most fascinating, is the brain will actually make connections that would otherwise have gone unrealized, meaning that you, we will jump through such mental hoops in order to not just to judge favorably, but to accommodate our perception of goodness. And there's something the brain, actually it's, it's a, it's a, it's a psychological phenomenon called heuristics, which basically is a shortcut. We would be unable to make uh, all of the decisions we need to each and every moment unless we had a way for sort of coming up with a shorthand way of dealing with life. So for example, this comes up a lot, by the way, for people in business, in retail, and it's used a lot of influence and persuasion in uh, not necessarily the most Ehrlich, the most uh, upstanding ways. I'll give you a couple of examples so that you could watch out for them, not that you should use them on other people. But one of the, uh, the heuristics is something called scarcity, which means that we generally believe that that which is rare and diminishing is worth more because generally speaking, that which is rare and diminishing is worth more. Right? You've, gold is worth more than silver, so more than bronze, bronze more than tin, and so on. So if it has something has an inherent or innate value and there's less of it or it's harder to get to, then we generally assign more value to it, which is why ads will always say last chance, you know, small opportunity to act, you know, lim uh, limited supply and so on. You think, for example, that companies that spend millions of dollars in advertising their coupons and their products would go ahead and they would say, you know, at the bottom, don't worry about it. When you get around to using it, when you get off the couch, when Corona's done, go out and enjoy it. It doesn't say it. It says, act now, 30 days and so on, because they don't understand human nature. And that is that if there's no impetus to act, we're not going to. And unless that window begins to close, sometimes on websites you'll see sort of these counters down, it's not going to motivate us. And when we see it, it does activate that thing called heuristics. And there are other heuristics as something called uh, contrast and comparison. We don't see things in and of themselves, but by contrast. So a very quick other example. I know I speak very, very quickly, by the way. I can't tell you, I don't know a single talk I've given live where the organizer didn't come over to me in advance and say, by the way, if you can just do me one thing, I go, I know, slow it down. It's, it's once again, this is, this is not a mile. I happen to teach public speaking. This is something that's, I still have a problem with. Uh, but like they say, those that can't do teach. Um, 
So the other one is contrast and comparison, and that basically says we don't see things in and of themselves, but in contrast to something else. So for example, you walk into a store and you see a suit, it says $500, good price, who knows? Marked down from 2000, wow, must be amazing because you're contrasting one for the other. Now, if you recall the original thread of this conversation, we we're speaking about heuristics and about shortcuts and how we get into that, and that is from this larger sort of uh, umbrella called reticular activating system, which hones in, hones in on what's important and uses heuristics, meaning that rather than make a decision each and every time, we go ahead and put people and put things into certain baskets categories. Which is why, when you want to improve relationships, this brings us to the larger point here that we want to flesh out, and that is that you want to get in the category of can do no wrong. See, there are people in our lives that put in the category of can do no right and can do no wrong. You want to be in the category of can do no wrong. And the way to get into that, we're going to get to probably maybe uh, next uh, Motsi Shabbos. But for now, return to the original conversation about focusing on the positive. Remind yourself that by looking for the good, you're going to see the good. You're going to construct the good, and you're going to live in a different world. It's not about looking through rose-colored glasses, by the way. People very often say, oh, so fine, you know, there's, there's, uh, I'm just you know, putting a positive spin. It's not about that. You'll actually see things that would otherwise have gone unnoticed. For example, take somebody who is a sophisticated wine consumer. That's certainly not myself, but somebody who understands wines. They will taste something in the wine. They will enjoy the wine in a way that I could not and unsophisticated consumers could not as well. Coffee, the same thing. You have people who are coffee aficionados. They understand the different tastes and the, uh, the flavors and whether it's bold or this. And I do have you know, some preferences, but certainly not to the depth of somebody who really understands it. And that's because their knowledge increases their awareness of it. So our ability to look for the good, to see the good, to appreciate the good, is what will allow for us to have a transformative relationship with people. So the next time you enter into conversation with somebody, again, have in mind, something we touched on last month, Chavez, just have in mind that you're going to be looking for the good. Take a few minutes to frame your thinking. Focus on the positive, the virtues, the miles of this person. It's so easy to focus on the negative. And there's something called negativity bias where we're more inclined to focus, actually seven times more likely to focus on the negative than we are on the positive. And it does take wiring to rise above our nature, but that's our jobs. Our job is not to give in to our nature, it's to rise above our nature. And the ego that eats a horror loves to put people in the categories. It loves to, um, to judge and to narrate. By the way, just the reason it does that is because we can feel more secure if we're able to label, to categorize, to blame, to justify, to sort of explain away everything that goes on in our world, which is why there's some, that one of the defense mechanisms, the way the ego has to protect itself, um, is like this. You know, you hear about a, a tra somebody dies in a, an auto accident and you find out that they weren't wearing their seatbelt, right? That gives you a warped sense of solace because now you can explain, you can understand why it happened. Right? The ego loves, it needs to be able to take this infinite uh, world and sort of compartmentalize it into things that we can easily understand. And we can't. It's many things are beyond our understanding, which is why where Batuchin comes in. Different conversation. But back to our original conversation about appreciation and about looking for the good and expecting to see the good. Let me share with you, we'll end with this, a short story. Right now we have these sort of, you know, makeshift minyamin where uh, they're outdoors and Somebody was, uh, this, this uh, couple of days ago, uh, you know, the balabus is, you know, the gabai, the outdoor shul, lovely guy, terrific guy. You know, we wrap things up, and I said, you know, maybe give a shout out to um, the young boy, the bacher, maybe 13, 14, who laned. And he said, no, he lanes here all the time. He lanes here, uh, you know, uh, throughout the week. I didn't know this because it was the first time I was at this particular minion. And I went over to him afterwards. And I said, why does it matter that he always lanes. The fact that he always does something, why does that diminish our need to go ahead and to acknowledge it? Sometimes we think if somebody does something magnificent, and man, sure, the first time he laned, everyone probably said, yeah, Yashakar, great job. Second time, third time, it dissipates. We want the, shouldn't it be the other way around? Shouldn't it be the more somebody extends themselves, the more they do something, the more we want to show our appreciation and acknowledge it? Yet, we get used to it. And if you think about all the good, all the beautiful things that people around us do for us on a daily basis, it becomes road, it becomes normal, and it sort of falls into that category of expectancy and entitlement.
But you can transform your relationships by reminding yourself that nobody has to gotta. My father always used to say that. Nobody has to gotta. Nobody has to do something. It doesn't have to be this way. The fact that they do it is beautiful and acknowledge it. And it makes you want to do it more. When somebody says to you, Yasha Clark, great job, amazing, that was beautiful, genuinely so, it makes you want to give more. It makes you want to do more. Whether it's our spouse, whether it's our children, whether it's our rabbi, coworker, friend, neighbor, it doesn't make a difference. If they do it once or they do it 10,000 times, acknowledge the good. And the only way you're going to be able to acknowledge it is if you focus on it. Look for the good and you're going to find the good. I wish you all a beautiful week. Amir Tashem. See you back here next time. Moti Shabbos.